Thank you for your patience. You know, like until I broke them in, and now they're perfect. It just took like a weekend of pain. My, so mine yeah, they're in my sorrel, part, otherwise sorrel, I'd hand it yeah, to you. Yeah, but you can tell because they always have the like intense, toothy soul. Like mine. Hey, okay, Mike, Mike Lacey, w would you like to give your public comment again? Well, again. Uh, all right. Hey, so hold on. I'm, we're going to start the meeting from the very beginning again because none of that was on the record. So um, the sound guys are going to get thanked twice. All right, take two. I would like to call to order this meeting of the Grants and Funding Committee for Nashville Metro Arts. As always, Metro Arts' mission is to drive an equitable and vibrant community through the arts. Uh, my name is Commissioner Tim Jester, and I'm the chair. Uh, you know, maybe, I'm, I'm not supposed to be comedic up here. If you guys laugh, I'm going to laugh. Uh, we have Commissioners Leah Love, Carol McCoy, and Dewana Wade, uh, who are also serving on this committee. We are joined today by staff, uh, Sydney Davis, who is our Strategic Grants and Initiatives Manager, and Ms. Vivian Fox, uh, who uh, is making everything else happen today. Uh, first, I would like to offer, again, uh, just a sincere apology to everybody who showed up here on Monday and then had to go home because we canceled the meeting. Uh, a brief explanation of what happened. Uh, there is usually an email that accompanies the agendas when they are posted to the web page. Uh, and that agenda was posted Friday at 327, but the accompanying email that either most of us didn't know existed or thought was automatic uh, is apparently not automatic. There is a manual process uh, that did not happen until Monday morning at 7 a.m. And so because of that, we made uh, the difficult call uh, to, to try and be in compliance with open meetings laws uh, to go ahead and cancel that meeting. So. I know that's a little consolation, but I'm sorry that uh, that a lot of people took time and effort to come uh, and then were turned away. And, and then finally, I would just like to say thank you to uh, to the sound guys who came and set everything up and then turned right back around and took it down. Uh, and I know I mentioned this before, it feels weird to say everything twice, but little known fact about Nashville is that Nashville really wouldn't exist the way it does without sound guys. There's a lot of rock stars and there are... Um, equally as many or more sound guys and the rock stars get all the all the attention so to the sound guys thank you the public is encouraged to attend commission and committee meetings and may make comments in person during the designated time on the agenda the public comment period is limited to 20 minutes total comments are limited to a maximum of two minutes per person persons wishing to provide comment on matters that are germane to items on the agenda must sign up prior to the beginning of the meeting on the sign-up sheet provided at the meeting the opportunity to provide public comment is offered on a first-come, first-served basis. At all meetings, the commissioner chairing the proceedings shall have the authority to manage or limit the number of persons who are non-commissioner members allowed to speak on an issue and to manage or limit time of such speakers. Ms. Fox, do we have any public speakers today? Yes, we have three, and our first is going to be Michael Lacey. Can you come to the podium? Thank you for being willing to speak again. Sure. And your time starts now. Uh, I've been told that uh, this update was made, um, some elements of it, at the um, city council meeting last night and also appeared in the MHRC uh, report. Um, but as some of you may be aware, I've been uh, making much public commentary highlighting the ways in which various metro departments may influence, in my opinion, extra legally the funding decisions of this commission. What I haven't focused on much are the preconditions that allowed this to happen and what could be done to prevent it in the future. When this commission voted to give funding last July, not only to particular orgs, but in a particular distribution methodology, it had not followed the metro obligated task of having the funding model approved by the city charter. The charter reads, and this portion is unaffected by a 2015 state law, that the city council must approve your funding criteria. In July of last year, this meant that one, the funding methodology arose to the attention of lawyers within Metro Legal after the vote took place. And two, the funding model did not have the political backstopping to challenge Metro Legal one and minute. interrogate their determinations in authority leading to the alleged Title VI violation. Despite the funding criteria methodology changing in important ways for many, many years, no director for the past 23 years has pursued the council approval when they changed the funding methods, including with the invention of Thrive back in 2014. Why did no director get approval? 
since 2001 because Metro Legal didn't tell them they had to. Metro Legal's advice is just that advice, and it can be fallible, as we see with the alleged Title VI violation. N neglecting that informed directors get approval by counsel also leaves Metro Legal with a lot of power to overturn those decisions. Moving forward, I might assume that Public Arts Chair is looking, uh, Public Arts Chair Joyce Stiles is looking forward to the proposal from this commission for its grant methodology for FY25, and I. Uh, and you would have the benefit of the city council's law department for compliance of all federal, state, and local laws. And I would assume there would be enthusiasm for the recent community-driven grant models Time. that were developed. So approval would likely not stray terribly far from that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have on the list Emma Sapika. All right. <laughs> all right. Your time starts now. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm sorry that I talked about my shoes and everybody heard. Um, I do want to say that uh, I'm here just to publicly say that I really appreciate the staff of the Metro Arts staff for making a huge effort to keep communicating, receiving communica communication from us, the, the arts community, proactively communicating with us, even in imperfect ways or in process ways. Um, I think that, you know, I and my, my centered art form, I have a high tolerance for process driven communication. So I, I understand that, but I think that a lot of, a lot of us just really appreciate that even in, even in imperfect settings, um, we receive and appreciate all, all of that to come. So in that same vein, I hope that whatever we talk about today with grants and updates, I look forward to hearing them. And I know that we will continue to have more questions. And so as many, as, as much of that communication as we can keep open as possible, um, I encourage you to do that. Um, we just have s as much information about how, when, who, the terms. We, you know, we're, we're panicking a little bit on this end just without information um, even. And so appreciate what's come and just please continue to do that. Uh, and the final thing that I want to say uh, in regards to today's agenda specifically is about Thrive. You know, I don't have all the insight about funding mechanisms um, and how all of that happens, but I will say that I, as a, a member of the public and an individual artist, we must maintain Thrive. We must maintain that program uh, in a sustainable, transparent, equitable way moving forward. So please, I implore you, Thrive must continue to exist. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next person and our last on our um, public comments is Miss Christine Hall. Hello. All right, Hello. your time starts now. Thank you. Hello, Metro Arts Commissioners and staff and artists and enthusiasts and advocates. I really appreciate each and every one of you in this room because I know you're coming together on something hard to do. And that is find a way forward on divisive grounds. And it's been difficult. And I just want to acknowledge that my introduction to Metro Arts happened with the grants editing process. Um, I mean, years before that, I had a poem on a bus through one of your, <laughs> but that's not really, okay. So I have an interest in seeing through that process. I loved that there was an outreach to the community to listen. For representative government is always so exciting to me for art that reflects, but also to propel us forward. Like we know that's what art does. It energizes us. It is the thing that we can center around the community, the culture, the expressiveness, the things we want to affirm. I heard you say human to human. I hear you. I love that. I want that. I think we all do. We have all these things standing in the way, right? But we can focus on where we agree. We agree on equity. We agree equity looks like all of us, looks like the community. It means distributing our public dollars in a public way that reflects the community that we're serving, that lets everyone have a voice. There's been so much pain and hurt. I am sorry for that. I hate that. I want us to heal and be creative about how we move forward and keep these public processes public, keep them inviting, inclusive, accessible, listen to the community, reflect what you've heard, keep us in the loop. We love you for it. Thank you. And really, I just, I want to say thank you to everyone for lending your voices to this. We need all of the extremes represented to find the ground that's going to serve the most of us and allow Allow us to dissent as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
And I'm not sure if it's appropriate to say this or not, but I've read your book of poetry and it's pretty fantastic. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's like 12 years ago. I, cool. <laughs> All right, that concludes our public comments. We're going to move on in the agenda to updates. So the first thing I want to talk about is that... Um, Letters to Thrive and operating grant recipients did go out last week. I've heard some feedback about uh, maybe some agitation around the uh, manner in which it was handled. Letters going out that have to be replied to via United States Postal Service. And, and um, all, all I can say is that I'm, I'm sorry it wasn't in a more convenient manner. I think that was the quickest way to possibly get it done and out the door. Uh, so as an art community, I would just encourage you that if you know people who are supposed to be receiving letters, follow up with them and make sure they've gotten them. I've gotten at least one email from somebody who had the wrong address in the system. Uh, and so there are some of these errors that are going to happen. We do not want those to happen. And so let's, let's work together to hold everybody accountable to making sure they've gotten the letters and they've gotten them back so everybody gets appropriate funding. Uh, also, um, this is a harder thing to acknowledge, uh, but uh, it, it does appear um, that mural artists are not uh, going to be included in those payments uh, uh, going out but for Thrive or for um, operating grants. There's a lot of confusion about why that happened. I'm not going to go into it all today, uh, but they were never part of a commission uh, vote, and so they are currently not on the list of uh, people that are going to receive payments. I would also like to note, though, that uh, they are 36 of the complainants on the MHRC report, and so they will continue to be um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, heralded, they're, they're um, heralded along by the MHRC in, in that conciliation process. Uh, so um, that's the update for mural artists. Um, I'm going to move on to an update about the Tennessee Arts Commission. Uh, the ABC, for, for many years, uh, Metro Arts has been an ABC grant designee, uh, and we lost that this year uh, because of uh, the, sort of the disorder that we find ourselves in right now. Um, we lost that status for this year. I have not heard as to whether or not we will get it back. Uh, I would like to think that we can uh, clean up our uh, our act and regain that ABC grant. I've also been told that it doesn't have, it's, it's really mostly passed through money, so it's not going to affect uh, it's not going to negatively impact the budget for us, but it is something that we would like to be responsible enough to to be the designee to get that money out to the arts community. So we're going to work hard to get that uh, get that back. We did not lose the major cultural institution grant, the MCI grant. I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Love. So. Uh, in one second. Uh, I did skip right over the minutes, which are here, uh, and have all the commissioners had a chance to review them? Yes. Are there any changes that need to be made? Just to clarify, this is for the March 13th minute. Yeah, this is for our last meeting, the March 13th meeting. Any changes that need to be made? Might I have a motion to accept these minutes? So moved. That was Commissioner Wade, a second. Commissioner McCoy, all in favor? Aye. Commissioner Wade, are you in favor? Okay. And the ayes have it. Uh, also, a follow-up to the October 9 meeting minutes that we talked about last time that were not there. Um, I am told that our good staff is recreating those minutes, and we will have those available to uh, approve at the next meeting. Just really quick, I just wanted to apologize to the public and to the commission on those minutes. Um, I have searched my computer high and wide. Um, that's why they will be recreated um, and then voted on in the next meeting. Um, so I just want to apologize for that. Um, them not being ready and prepared. <clears throat> Apology accepted, but I think also unnecessary. I know we're all working very hard, and thank you for working very hard. I just wanted to make it a, a, a matter of the public record that they were going to come along and we we're going to be able to vote on them. So, 
All right. So approval of minutes. We moved on to updates. We've covered uh, the second payment for FY24 and the Tennessee Arts Commission uh, and the payments to mural artists. So we to old and new business. Uh, and so believe it would be good for us to talk about uh, m moving the grant cycle to late fall. And there are several reasons for this. Um, number one, it's already been suggested by the mayor's office that there might be a delay uh, in funding. Uh, it's been politely asked by finance that we not make any more financial obligations until we get to the bottom of where we are financially now. Uh, and it would also give us the opportunity to align our grant cycle with the fiscal year that money's coming from. And so we would be granting money from a pile of money that we can quantify instead of the other way around, which has been for several years. So I think it's worth having that discussion uh, and would like to do that now. What say you? What are your questions or thoughts? Um, may I? Yes. Uh, my questions and thoughts are always around, okay, I'm not opposed to changing anything or change, but anytime there is change, I always ask the question, who will be harmed by the change and what will that harm look like? And so I guess I would just need to hear what that harm will look like. Change happens all the time and that's okay. Sometimes change makes things better, sometimes change makes things worse, but you know, what harm is going to come from us doing that? And that's just my question, and I hope the conversations kind of center around that. Yeah. So we're out of time for public comment, but uh, receiving emails from people in the community about what that harm might look like, I think would be very constructive. Uh, I would say that the situation that we find ourselves in now has been very harmful. And so while we do want to avoid any harm moving forward, we also want to make sure that we don't end up in the same situation that we're in right now. And I think we have a very high likelihood of doing that if we just continue to charge into this grant, into this grant session. Um, Cindy, do you have anything you want to add to this? Um, no, I'm kind of echoing what you're saying. I think it's really important that um, uh, for lack of better words, the situation that we're in now, there's going to have to be some decisions made on how we move forward. Uh, you know, currently we're working with making sure that those of the 24 grant cycle are um, having their, their concerns heard and answered to as quickly as possible. But 25 is a completely new, completely new cycle. And I think we pausing and then re restarting back in early fall, late summer, will give us the opportunity to make sure that all of our T's are crossed, all of our I's are dotted, give enough time to make sure that we're handling everything the way that we need to before we start and invite an additional group of people in to, uh, to apply for any type of grant. I have a question um, or maybe a comment. I am wondering if as we talk about what this delay looks like, can we get specific on the grant dates or the, the dates that we want to move the cycle back. That may be helpful for people who are not privy to what that information is. And then I heard you, uh, uh, Chair Jester, ask for input via email and things of that nature. And so um, I think it is important that we do give community members, especially those who sit on committees with us through other um, means, um, an opportunity to talk about and understand why the change is happening. And so I think it is important that we hear from community before we actually make the decision to make the change. Um, though I am not averse to the change um, or a change just because I, I don't know a person that is interested in redoing this. So no. um, I, I'm, a pause for me is not always a traumatic thing, especially because we have not already made decisions around what funding looks like. I think we have, we need to take some time to do a better job of what we're doing. So I'm echoing previous comments. Uh, I would just like to be very clear for the public that this is, this would be a, a brief delay, not a cancellation of grant funding for the year. Just, uh, just an opportunity to step back, take a deep breath and make sure we don't end up in the same situation again. Um, and so I, and I agree with you, Commissioner Wade, we, um, we're not going to 
I, I'm not suggesting that we make any decision around this today. Um, I, I think we do need to hear from the community, and we need to, to make sure that we're taking measured steps that take the community into account, um, because the arts community is the whole reason we're here, so we need to hear from the arts community. Uh, I would say that I think this is worth conversation in the broader commission meeting, uh, and so uh, I would, I, I guess I would make a motion that we recommend that the broader commission talk about this funding cycle delay in our next open commission meeting, but just for discussion, not for making any specific uh, decisions. So there's a motion there on the table uh, uh, to recommend to the general commission that we discuss uh, amongst the whole commission uh, uh, delaying the grant cycle to late summer, early fall. Do all in favor? All right. Yeah, actually, I think I was supposed to go to discussion before I went to all in favor. So let's go to discussion. Robert's uh, rules. Late summer, early fall. Are we? I'm not sure. So we, we talked about some specific dates, but I don't know that we should make decisions about specific dates without community input, right? And so I'm, I'm being purposely vague because I don't, I, I, we, we could lay out some very exact dates, but I feel like us doing that without feedback from the community would, would I mean, I guess at worst be out of line, but at best be sort of insensitive to what, what might be best for the community. So I, we have to do what's, we, we have to make sure that we're healthy, uh, a healthy little home here before we, before we start funding money again, but we need to do that in whatever the best means is possible to, to, um, eliminate as much pain as possible uh, and so that's why that's why the the, the um, late summer early fall uh. and my question around specific dates really is what is the so our fiscal year at Salama is July 1 through June 30 so are we talking October May or do we not even know that when we talk about aligning the grant cycle with the fiscal year fiscal year being well it would more be that we wouldn't make a decision about funding in general until we have received a budget from metro themselves and they don't have a and that ballpark date at this point and rough estimate is july okay. at the end of the year or at the end of the fiscal year and so we're proposing and having possibly having a conversation once we get community input um, about having a grant cycle start once we know what that number is going to be for Metro. Metro's fiscal year ends in July. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So late, late summer, early fall. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with making this recommendation to the big commission, but this type of work happens in the committee. So That's I correct. believe that the best way to handle this is the committee hear from the community, make a recommendation of what to do, and present that to the big commission, and the commission votes on that. And the, the discussion can happen that way, but typically work like this happens in the committee, yep. um, and because that's what the committee is for, you know, the smaller committee to, so it would, nothing is wrong with having a discussion in the big meeting, but the best way, I think, is to the committee make a actual recommendation and I don't think the committee is ready to do that yet just because we haven't heard from um, the community and it's just premature to to maybe have a conversation nothing's wrong with it I'm not opposed to it but um, to be less confusing maybe until we have more information I think the committee needs to make an actual recommendation for the big commission to vote on yeah, I think you're 100% right about that. So forgive me uh, in my newness as uh, a committee chair. Uh, we'll, we'll keep discussing it. Um, but you're right. So I withdraw the motion, uh, and we can keep talking about it here if there's more to say, and then also just implore the community and those most uh, affected by a potential delay to reach out and let us know uh, to, to our individual email addresses so we can discuss it further in the next meeting as well. I withdraw my second. I do have a question, and that is based on what Mr. Lacey said. And that is, as we get into whatever the budget process is and when it's going to be set up and how it's going to be set up, 
I understood him to say that Metro Council has to approve our funding process. That's what I understood him to say. And I think we should take that into consideration this first go round that whatever we do, we should try to get it to the council in sufficient time that they can approve it so that we can get the grant money to the artists. That's another hiccup in the timing of everything. Because just because we send it to the Metro Council, I don't know how they do their committee structure and I don't know how long it would take from once we give them what we propose and including the, the shift on the cycle how long it would take for the council and their committees to get it to a floor vote. But I think a lot of things have happened in the Arts Commission for a number of years that are slowly coming to awareness. And I think we all want to do what is the right thing. And if the Metro Council has to approve what we do, then we need to take that. We have to take that into consideration. Um, I, I agree. I heard uh, Ms. Bytelder's comments to the commission last night and thought they were very timely, as well as uh, Mike's, Mike Lacey's comments, Michael Lacey's comments this morning. Uh, and I do think that this decision, uh, I mean, I, we can talk about it more and recommend it to the general uh, commission, but uh, I do think that working in conjunction with the commission to have that support behind us in the decisions we make is, is going to be very important moving forward, uh, as well as with the, the um, Budget and Oversight Committee as well. Any other comments or thoughts around the possible uh, delaying of the grant cycle this year? All right. With that, we will move on to discussion around uh, the fiscal year 25 Thrive program. Um, there are several reasons why Thrive needs to be removed uh, from the delegated procurement program. And we're going to discuss those today. Uh, I want to be very clear that nobody is suggesting that we eliminate Thrive or decrease funding for Thrive or in any way uh, use this opportunity to send money places other than individual artists or smaller art organizations in Nashville. That is not the point of this conversation. Uh, I can't speak for everyone else or their intentions, but as the chair of this committee, I want to be clear that that is not the point uh, of this conversation. The point of this conversation is to find a way to make sure that Thrive falls within the legal bounds of our enabling ordinance, of Metro Code, of our bylaws, uh, and, and that we can use it as an opportunity to hopefully send more money to individual artists and to, uh, and to small art organizations in the community. To that end, uh, we've invited Ms. Amanda Deaton-Moyer uh, to the meeting today. Uh, she is from uh, the delegated procure uh, from finance and is the specialist in delegated procurement, and would like to invite her to uh, to talk about delegated procurement and some of the ins and outs of that uh, process. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for being here on Monday. Oh, no worries. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Deaton Moyer. I'm with the Finance Department. And as a bit of a background, I have um, worked in a department, much like the arts, for a long time and had to interact with Delegated Purchasing Authority. And so um, when the purchasing agent asked me to come, I was like, yeah, you know, this, this, is, a, this is a neat, neat conjunction of that space. Um, so I am aware that you all have the um, procurement manuals. It's been part of your packet, so I'm going to try my best not to repeat what's in there too much. Um, but when we talk about delegated purchasing authority, each department ha um, is given this authority, and it's signed every year. And it is an authority that anything below $2,500, one quote, it goes through a process. You get a quote, and it goes into our large accounting system and generates a purchase order, and then it becomes an agreement with a vendor to, to actually do that work. And once that work is received, 
um, that work in, we pay the vendor, the artist, wh whomever, um, for that work received. And, you know, in most cases, we want someone to put eyes on the thing or the service or, you know, right, right acknowledgement of that service. So in the case of delegated purchase authority, there's a consideration. The de department, the city, wh whomever has received something, whether it's a good or a service. When we move into any item past the, that 2500, 2499 threshold, um, we actually say, okay, world, there's competition out there and we want us, we want to ask and the procurement manual even encourages us to seek not just people we might know or anything, but also actually seek um, minority owned businesses <clears throat> as well, as well as, you know, those businesses in the community that are local and so forth. And <clears throat> well, it is a quote you say your it is a scope it's a specified um, scope that says this is what we need and this is when we need it and this is how we need it and vendors respond and the department can choose that can choose based on value and i use the word value very specifically and not cost sometimes a vendor can't get it when you need it if you've got to have a toilet fixed i don't care if you can do it next week you need it right now Things, things of that nature. And so there are a lot of different, vari but you would say so in a scope. And so that's generally across departments how that works. Now, if it's over $25,000, and those of you working with public art know this, it goes to purchasing and it, um, and it is, goes in a form of an RFP, ITV, or a, in this case, a call to artists. And it is something that we, that goes out to a, a lot of people and it ultimately amounts in a contract but going backwards POs are contracts too and so <clears throat> what has happened here and trying not to editorialize or there it is simply scope is for something asked and something received and so I want to move into um, if you'll allow me what may be your question and if it's not I'm just assuming so is the difference between grants and a purchase um, so a grant, and I've got a little chart in front of me, so, cause I needed the cheat sheet, um, is he, in a situation where there's a grant, the public authority is providing funds to a recipient to enable the recipient to achieve its own goals and objectives that are consistent with public authority policy. And so it may not get something, but the goals are aligned. A purchase is used for the direct benefit of the government and seeks best value. So it's a thing or a service. Um, a grant, an award of financial assistance to a recipient to support or stimulate the accomplishment of a specific purpose or goal. On the other side, it's the goal, the specific stated scope. Um, the government defines the scope. And with a grant, a recipient can talk, can usually um, has a level of discretion on how they utilize funding. You'll know grant spending plans. We're going to do it in this area. We're going to spend X amount of dollars in the area of materials. Whereas um, with a purchase, we're, we're going to say, no, 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 you're spending $10 on paper. Um, so there, there's very specific things that are specified. And, you know, they're, they're, I can say this in a lot of different ways, but a key part of this too is how payment happens. Sometimes grants have advances. In the case of our ABC grants, we actually do a 40% advance to all of our for, uh, our ABC recipients. Sometimes, and they, you know, you get the money up front, and we ask in a grant, we ask, okay, you've got the money now. Show us what you're going to do, how that aligns with our goals. Whereas in a purchase, it is, please give me my thing or show me my service, give me this invoice and we will pay you accordingly or according to the terms negotiated in that contract specifically. Um, and that's not to say that grants do not have contracts, but they are aligned with, um, <clears throat> they can be done in a lot of different ways that are not necessarily for consideration. So that those are key differences there. And in the case, well, so the argument can be made, well, it was a call to art, artists, it's, it's a scope, but it's community goals and community needs as, and they're, they're done in the way that artists see fit, whereas it's not a specific scope for a specific thing. Um, an example of this, and I'm gonna make this really brief, is I'm actually, um, Chris, um, was talking about this yesterday, the idea of an oil painting. 
let's say this organization has, a, you know, defines a public value of, and I'm just, understand this is a gross baseline, <laughs> um, a, we define a public interest or a public value of oil paintings. And this is a, this is our interest and our, we have a value and we think the community would be better if there are more of them. Um, and, and so if we're doing a, the purchasing route, we would define the scope. We want a 36 by 48 and we want, at we have to gather at least three quotes and we want to know when they're done and we're going to check up on how you're doing while we will attribute this to an artist. Once it is done, it is ours. We'll hang it on the wall and we will have a lovely plaque that says who did, did, did said thing, but it will be the possession of the government. Whereas if it were a grant, it might be that we do a call to artists and we say we want, we're going to develop this program to meet this community goal. Um, artists would submit ideas and it might not be to just, you know, create a beautiful piece of art. It may be to encourage children to do paintings. It may be to develop interest. However, and then a panel would choose based on a set of criteria and the outcomes would be measured based on those criteria. And Metro wouldn't own anything at the end. Metro would be proud that it, it contributed to the community benefit and those organizations would be proud that they continued their goals and their their needs and also did that in, in conjunction. So that's kind of the difference here. And I see the rest of your agenda. So using that example, the rest of your agenda um, goes into what the charter provisions say and so forth. And I know you'll get into that, but part of some of these, this, you know, it's how this might, we might have gotten here is the charter says it goes to organizations or not the charter, excuse me, the ordinance and, and, the, and the code section. And that's, that, those must be grant, and we can, the commission can give grants. And that's where maybe the cross happened. But that's, anyway, so that's delegated purchasing authority. I'm happy to answer questions if I can, and if not, I'll go and get the right answers for you. Does anybody have any questions? I think this is a good question. So, Moving this out of the procurement process, is that because of the charter or because you you don't have the capacity to do it, if that makes sense? It's because of the procurement rules and regulations. Okay, okay. And this answer wouldn't be for you, but or this question, I'm just thinking, has there ever been a discussion to align Metro's procurement process like the state does their procurement process? Because if I remember correctly, the state's procurement office has a grants program under procurement. And so I'm just I'm just wondering, is, is the staff not there to do it or is it just because that's not what you're supposed to do based on charter? And that's fine too. It's based on rules and regulations, many of which come straight from the state. Mm -hmm. And the state also counts grants differently. They may be in the same space, but they're also treated differently. Right. Okay. I have a question around um, well, it says here that between twenty-five hundred dollars and twenty-four thousand nine hundred ninety-nine, there are three written quotes required with an award going to the uh, to the most advantageous to Metro. So that seems like one of the bigger sticking points for me, and I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. When we bring in uh, um, requests from artists, it's just one per art project, right? So wouldn't wouldn't we need three per art project in order to be in alignment with, with yes. procedural code you, here? You'd have a specific scope. That's why I kind of used a very basic oil, like one painting. We want a painting, and that's the scope. So you would get three quotes, for, at least three quotes. Um, you know, if you were selecting more, you could. But um, but it's that best value, and you have to have it for a specific scope. It can't be simply as broad. So that we, so that it can be defined. Yeah. Any other questions? I want to say this has been very helpful, and I found six point three in this brochure is the designated purchases, and I think you've spelled out very clearly what the situation needs to achieve financing that is proper and how it meets these requirements and that's what we need to do to protect the thrive program i think so i think so too thank you i understand what you're saying 
Thank you very much for coming Monday, for coming today, and for the explanation. Glad to. We're at your service when you need. Thank you very much. I'm just going to move on to the second point here, Metro's charter or our enabling ordinance. So um, in Metro Charter Part 1, Chapter 1, Section 11.107, the bylaws, rules, and regulations to be filed with Metropolitan Clerk. Uh, each board or commission may make such bylaws, rules, and regulations not inconsistent with law as it deems appropriate for the conduct of business, copies of which shall be filed with the Metropolitan Clerk and with the Secretary of the Board or Commission. So that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Metro Arts, but it does require Metro Arts to follow the rules that Metro uh, creates for us, and then it requires that we follow the bylaws that we have as well. Uh, and then moving on to Metro Code pertaining to Metro Arts. Uh, Metro Code Title II Administration, Chapter 2.112, Metropolitan National Arts Commission, Section 2.112.040, Powers and Duties, beginning in subsection H. Awards funds appropriated to it by the Metropolitan Council to deserving nonprofit, civic, and nonprofit charitable organizations. Criteria for awarding of such funds shall be established by the Metropolitan National Arts Commission and approved by resolution of the Metropolitan Council. One, a nonprofit charitable organization is defined as one in which no part of the net earnings benefit any private shareholder or individual and which provides year-round services benefiting the general welfare of the residents of the municipality. Two, a nonprofit civic organization is defined as a civic organization exempt from taxation pursuant to Section 501C of the IRS Code. A nonprofit civic, this is great stuff in it. A nonprofit civic organization must operate primarily for the purpose of being about civic betterment and social improvements through efforts to maintain and increase employment opportunities in the municipality. And three, for the purposes of this code section, both nonprofit charitable organizations and nonprofit civic organizations shall be involved in the study, participation, and the appreciation of the visual, performing, and literary arts of the Metropolitan Nashville and Davidson County area. Um, and then finally, Metro Art Bylaws. So Article 3, Powers and Duties. The Commission shall have such powers and duties as established by Chapter 2.112, Section 2.112.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, and such additional duties as may be delegated by the City Council and the Mayor. The specific powers and duties enumerated in Chapter 2.112, Section 2.112.030 are incorporated by reference. Broadly speaking, these powers and duties include award funds. Metro Arts shall award funds to nonprofit civic and charitable organizations that assist the Arts Commission in carrying out its purpose, as stated in the Metropolitan Code, Section 2.112.030 and its goal stated herein and provide artistic benefit to the general welfare of the national community that was a lot of legalese I just felt like it was appropriate to read all that because we heard from delegated procurement about why uh, Thrive isn't the best fit for that particular funding model and then we actually have um, our charter which requires that we follow our own rules we have Metro Code that says we have to give to nonprofits and uh, uh, and and um, um, well, nonprofit organizations, and then we, our own bylaws say that. And so, if we can find a way to bring Thrive into compliance, then I think we won't end up in this position again, and we'll be able to use this newer, better version of Thrive to fund even more money to individual artists and art and art organizations and communities. So. I guess I'll open the floor to thoughts or questions about any of that. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I hear us talking about working to protect Thrive. And <clears throat> I want to make sure, because yeah, that was a lot of legalese. Uh, this packet is a lot to read. And there's been precedent set for years and years of funding artists directly. And I'm not quite sure, t uh, Commissioner Jester, that I agree that we're in this spot because we funded artists. Um, I, 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 so I'm not sure of that. And so <clears throat> if our interest is in removing it from delegated pro procurement, removing five, Thrive from delegated procurement, and all of those rules that you just read are primarily about funding civic organizations, nonprofit organizations, et cetera. 
I'm clearly missing something on how we are funding and protecting Thrive, which has to date with multiple um, votes from council year after year, approving funds to artists. And so, again, lots to read, not just today, but just in general, and other things that I also have to read. I may be missing something, but I'm not quite sure how removal from delegated, delegated procurement or this vote that has happened multiple years in council doesn't give us the opportunity to continue to do that in protecting Thrive in the way that it does support artists in doing their work. Yeah, those are yeah, um, great, great comments. Uh, I guess the first thing I would say is that, at least for me personally, I don't think we've ended up in this situation because we've funded individual artists. Uh, and if I came across that way, I didn't mean to. Um, also, I haven't been here for the last 10 years, so I don't know why it's worked when it's not been legal. And there is precedent. And I will say that an alternative, I think, to um, looking at ways to make Thrive legal would be to change the law. But has it not been legal? Or has council made a decision each year to make adjustments to how the funding was then able to be given to artists because I don't know that that makes it illegal. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and, and nice so, and I'm, I'm really not asking you per se. Yeah. I'm really just asking in general as I attempt to understand. <clears throat> so maybe then the question becomes, how is it then are we protecting Thrive by going to funding organizations because <clears throat> Excuse me, I apologize. Are you fine? If, if we're saying we're going, potentially, we're not saying that, mm -hmm. but if part of the conversation is protect Thrive by giving money to organizations, nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera, who's protected? May I say what something? What makes it equitable? How do the people who have been doing it for years, I believe legally because of the votes that council has done over years, how do they then potentially have the capacity to do that? And so again, I'm not asking you sure. per se, I'm just asking what that really does look like. Because I really do want to figure out how we can do both and. I think there is a way to do that. I am not convinced, even though I work for a nonprofit that used to write to Metro Arts, um, I'm not of the mindset that we have to do organizations only without doing artists. I think surely years and years of precedent since Thrive has been in existence, I don't get the feeling that what has been, doing, been done is illegal such that we can no longer do it is I it, so I'm clearly very very confused as to what makes it today illegal that it was not 1015 what thrive came out in 20 it's been more than 10 years yeah so uh, so I, I think the, the answers to those questions are all good, and I, I think they need to be talked about. Um, we have ended up in the situation we've ended up in um, for a bunch of different reasons, um, but and I, I don't know that it's specifically because of this, but it's thrown a light on it, and, and um, Metro Finance has, not that we take orders from Metro Finance, but they've as much as asked that we move out of the delegated procurement program, so that's why I think having the conversation is worthwhile. Uh, having the conversation is worthwhile. Yeah. Commissioner McCoy. Thank you. Um, when I look at our agenda, I see the discussion about the delegated procurement process that we've covered, and then I see Thrive Compliance Options as our next uh, matter. And I think part of what we're discussing 
in B, uh, under E, might be helpful if we heard from our grants manager um, a little bit of what she's thinking, because that might be the answer. Uh, yeah, I agree. I just wanted to make sure we had finished comments uh, on this before we move forward with that. Commissioner Love? Yes, I think that goes back to my initial comment that, like, I'm not opposed to moving it if that's what needs to happen, but are we moving it because of the code or because procurement doesn't have enough people to do it or house it? And 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 I, the state does handle grants and procurement differently, but it's still housed under the same department. And is are we doing it because the code says no or because we just can't do it anymore or we don't have enough people to do it? I think we really need to talk about about that part of it. And I'm not, it may be the best thing to do to move it. I don't know. But are we doing it just because what code says or procurement just doesn't have the bandwidth to do it right now with their resources? And not necessarily just because of what code says. Because... Thank you. And not necessarily just because code says, because code is, I mean, it's codified. Yeah. But are we doing it just because Metro Finance says? Yeah. Oh, and there's precedent that needs to be discussed too, so. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's a confusing situation. Um, so I think this, any other questions or thoughts about this? Okay. Well, we'll move to um, item C, Thrive Compliance Options, and just some of the um, general discussions that have been had around uh, some ways that we might be able to make this compliant. And I do think uh, that some of the thoughts here might answer some of your, commission, uh, your, your questions, Commissioner Wade. And I want to be very clear before we move into this section that uh, we're not making recommendations. Uh, we're not, um, nobody's voting on anything. Uh, this is, uh, and as I think everybody's made clear, uh, we might find a way to make it work the way it is. Uh, it's just become very clear that things are a mess right now. And so we need to figure out a way to not let that happen again moving forward. So with that, um, I think Sydney has prepared some talk, uh, thoughts, uh, talking points around these different, uh, these different funding options. Yeah, so I, I wanna make sure I make very clear, that, again, that these are not necessarily recommendations, but this is working under the guise that if we do have to follow code and bylaws in order to stay in compliance and our only function is to give money to nonprofit organizations. These are just, these are just some draft ideas. That's, that's all this is. It is just another plan C, plan D, in case we are not able to make um, larger overall changes to any of the bylaws or codes that we follow, um, because that will be a very, very long conversation. I, I do think that there's um, a highlight in pointing that there are the things that we want to do and the things that we can do in the moment, especially if we are to get grants out before the end of this year. Um, so even if there's a point where we're making a decision that's temporary for the sake of staying in compliance, and then once we're able to kind of get ourselves you know, back into the black and making sure that everyone from 24 is taken care of, that we were able to get a grant cycle out in 25, there's, no, there's nothing stopping us from then having a, an additional conversation, which then, you know, if we change something, mirrors more of what we've done last year compared to this year. I think the really big <laughs> note here is that I wanna make sure that artists, art organizations are funded this year. Um, so again, these are just, drafts, proposals. I mean, we're thinking out loud. This is the only time that we all have the ability to talk amongst each other and, and you know, try to get a thought train going on. And so that is, that's more or less what I'm here for. Um, so the first one is the idea of funding, a flat funding amount to one singular nonprofit organization, which will house Thrive uh, externally. As of right now, we're 15 staff for the department. I being the only grants person it's not fair to artists um, who have their varying amount of projects that are all in different scale and different size and different uh, hands-on in order to have one person manage all of those is, and so I have the ability to you know, get a coordinator or more, you know, more additional staff, uh, just the idea of housing one nonprofit that would off, you know, be involved with um, our grants committee, have them bring, bring someone on as a non-voting member so that we still have full buy-in for what any type of Thrive application would look like is that we would essentially be a pass-through through another 
delegated agency and they would handle Thrive to just, they would house it, we would pay for it. We would control the metrics, we would control the application, we would have them come and speak to us in terms of any data, any returns, but it just would not live under this roof physically, everything else would belong to us. Hence why it could work in a situation is that we would have one singular contract and then we would make sure that the, the one organization was staying in compliance with whatever community buy-in was, as well as what we deem necessary for any, any application. Mm -hmm. The other version of this, the option to the resource allocation is something that I'm... Hold on one second. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that first option before we move forward to the second one? Um, as we as we're throwing out ideas, have we thrown out ideas around how that organization, entity, et cetera, is selected? How none of that? Okay. No, and that, and I think that's the joy in drafting allowed in a group is the the idea that we are we're putting it out there. Uh, we want to make sure that we have community buy-in. We want to make sure that we're having feedback. That this is one of two of millions of options that we can come up with to try to get something on the books this year. Um, the goal would be that we would have more, once we make a decision on which direction we're going to go, then we get into the specifics and the nitty gritty about what that organization looks like, if it even exists. Right. You know, that's, it's a huge undertaking, um, especially with how especially, how much growth there's been in Thrive. And I mean, the numbers that we were throwing out is, if we have one singular contract that we can be in charge of and to maintain, then there's only one vote that we have to have amongst as a committee to how much we're going to fund it. Last year, I think Thrive was right under a million. If we were able to get this into a, a certain box, a certain set of parameters that everybody understood from the beginning, you know, there's no, I don't see why someone wouldn't say, let's put 1.2, 1.5, if we have that available to us. Um, so no, there haven't been any decisions about who that would go to, if it would even happen, or if that nonprofit organization exists within the Metro Nashville area because it's absolutely massive, which it should be. You know? That's that's why I was asking. Yeah. Because as we talk about being transparent and things of that nature, there certainly are some um, questions around what decisions have already been made, yeah, who is already in, in line to be this organization, all of those kinds of things. And so that's why I asked the question. Yeah, no, there, there have been absolutely no external communications about option one. And, and for option two, at that matter, it's more or less we want to make sure that we're not waiting um, until it's too late to mm -hmm. make a decision. And we want to make sure that the idea is sitting in front of everyone so that once we're ready to start making, you know, true decisions about anything about moving forward, that it's sitting there and it's not just a fresh idea. Yeah. Any other questions? No, go ahead. Okay, and now option two is very similar, except instead of one singular, um, we would essentially open up a grant, an, an, a, another grant process for small local organizations. The idea would be that we fund um, uh, organizations who would apply in a way that um, they would then have the ability to fund the artists that they already work with. They would have the ability to make the parameters. They would let us know uh, how they want to fund. We give them the ability to become grant-making organizations. Uh, it would be similar. It's like we would have a flat amount of funding that we would determine across, I'm throwing a number out, 20 organizations at $50,000 apiece, where we then say, hey, you take X amount of money, you tell us how you're going to grant it out to the community, um, give us some reporting throughout the year, come in at the end of the year, tell us how it went, and they get to determine in their own communities how they want to fund the artists that they work with. And again, this is still just a temporary solution. It still works because we're technically funding nonprofit organizations, but each organization, whether it's the singular or whether it's the many, um, would have the ability to fund artists directly. In a subcontracting kind of way Absolutely. that is, there is again, precedent for mm -hmm. that can 100%. easily happen. And so then, um, I apologize for going back. In mm -hmm. either of these in instances, is there then funding for that organization? So as a part of this funding, are they just grant making or are they also receiving um, funds to do the work? So this is the way that it's, I've been kind of formulating it in my mind, is that this, this would be completely separate from operating grants. So there would still be operating grants the way that there's operating and thrive now, except now we would have operating and that would be its own will. 
And then we would have the second option that would be either the additional one-time grant or the one-time grant out to one nonprofit who would then house Thrive for us, or the second option in which we would be a pass-through for 20, 30 odd different small local organizations, and they would then directly grant out to the artists that they deem and, and choose. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, and I, thank you, Sydney. And I just want to add to that, that if there's a way to make sure, if there's a way to be able to use the system that we have moving forward, there's a solve somehow. Um, we're willing to look into that too. Nobody's trying to, to do anything. Uh, we're not looking for the most difficult path. We're looking for the path that we can best send money from Metro Arts to artists in the community in a way that nobody can question and in a way that helps us if we end up in a situation like this again, not have a spotlight on how things haven't been done, um, I guess, procedurally speaking. So um, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions or comments or are we all done? Oh, and I just want to clarify that if we were to do either one of these options, um, you know, I have been wanting to make sure that the equity factor is highly involved in this. Um, we've had, um, I did have one singular conversation with the DE&I office here in Nashville and just asked them about these two, these two draft ideas and just wanted to see what they thought. And not only um, did they think that we, we might possibly be going in the right direction if this is where we decided to land, that they would also have someone called an equity facilitator that would be a part of every single step. So operating and or whatever we're calling this kind of Thrive compliance situation would always have a third party external person from the DE&I office um, as an equity facilitator for any types of training, for any panels, for any application pr uh, creation, for any um, any changes would always have a, a sec essentially a third set of eyes. It would be myself, the grants committee, as well as this third office to make sure that it's not a conversation that's just happening within these walls, but that it's going to step through three different filters and then still also go to the council. You know, we want to make sure that if these are the rules that are set in front of us, that we're following them until they change. Um, and until then, you know, we want to make sure that there's not going to be a slip through the cracks, that this feels as though it's covered in bias or that there's conversations are, are, that are not happening here at this table. So again, just to clarify, there have not been any sidebar conversations about option one or option two outside of does this work within the rules that are currently set what conversations can we have to possibly keep up with the times uh, later down the line? And then what can we do that is realistically going to be the fastest results for the sake of getting money out in this FY25 cycle? So it's like we're working from three different, three different bells here. The most, the most buy-in from the community and equity factors, what's going to be the fastest, and then also what can we do within the rules that are currently set regardless of how we feel about them? Um, I guess I would just finish up by saying these are two options. They're not the only two options. So as other uh, opportunities or options come to the table, we're open to looking at those two, including potentially being able to fix the current model to, to, to do what we need it to do. So we're, we're open to all those options. Uh, in the absence of any further comments or questions, uh, yes, Vivian. Um, before you adjourn, I just wanted to remind everyone, um, commissioners do know, but tomorrow we will have um, our commission meeting. It will be held at Lent's Health Department in their conference room. There will be signage um, so that you know which room to go into, um, but that room, that meeting is set for 12 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thanks, everybody. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.